Winter came and went. With the coming of summer, Tony and I started dressing neatly every day for the first times in our lives. Tony got a job delivering papers so he could have enough money to buy clothes. His mother shot up all the money she made, so he had to get his own. Jesse bought me anything I wanted within reason. So I was just about the best dressed boy in school. One day just after my 12th birthday, I came home from school and Jesse told me it was time for me to learn my street education. I didn't know what she meant because I thought I'd be learning about the streets without her knowing it. How utterly wrong was I? While I was eating, she told me she had to make a run, but she would be right back, so stay home. I waited impatiently until she returned. When she got back, she had a tall, dark man with her. I stared at him curiously. Since I had been born, this was the first man she had ever brought back to the house. Whenever Big Mama talked about pimps, she said I was the only pimp Jesse had or wanted. He was the darkest man I had ever seen. Actually, he was blue-black with large red lips. He wore thick, round glasses that made him look like an owl. Jesse introduced me to Fast Black. For the first time in my life, I learned that looks could be deceiving. He began teaching me all the convents that went into the game. Trickology must be used whenever it was possible to rip it off. Artifice became my Bible. As I learned how to play stuff, the shell game, pigeon drop, and three card molly. Before I turned 13, I was on my way to becoming a card sharp. And with a pair of craps, I was becoming a master. I could not shoot the turn down or pad roll. On sand, dirt, concrete, it didn't make any difference. Wherever they played, I just about had a shot for it. Fast Black used to tell me I could never claim to be good until I could take a pair of dice and get down on a blanket, then walk the dice from 2 to 12 without missing the sequence. My only problem at this time was the hours that Fast Black had me practice. I spent hour after hour in front of a mirror, pulling seconds or dealing cards from the bottom of the deck. When I finish with the cards, I have to spend two more hours shooting dice on the bed with the blanket drawn tight. To break the repetition of daily practice, Jesse asked Fast Black to teach Tony how to play. We competed against each other for pennies each day. It wasn't long before we were keeping all the boys at school broke. At lunchtime, you could always find a game going somewhere on a tiny school ground. There was a greasy spoon restaurant across the street from the school. Most of the kids gathered there to play the jukebox. The owner, Fat Sam, liked to watch the young girls dance, so the jukebox kept money in it. After one school day, Tony and I saw a crowd gathering in front of the restaurant. Anticipating a fight, we ran over and joined the crowd. Janet, with three of her girlfriends, stood in the middle of the crowd singing. I watched her leave the group. Her small hips swayed with the beat of the tune. I knew then I was through pulling her hair in the classroom. A police car pulled up and scattered the crowd. I slipped away from Tony and approached Janet. I removed her books from her arms. She turned and stared, astonished. We were too shy to talk much that first day. But after a few days, she began to ask serious questions. What you gonna do, horse son, when you get grown? Pimp, baby, pimp, I would answer. She would shake her head sadly. Don't you know there's better things in life? Why don't you finish school and go on to college? I'm ready for the fast track now, baby. I don't need no college. I replied as cool as possible. She puckered up and tears rolled down her cheeks. I stopped and pulled her into a doorway. 
Our lips met for the first time. The kiss tasted salty, but it seemed to stop her from crying, so I kissed her again. After a while, she pushed me back from her. She stared up at me seriously. We have to stop seeing each other, Hoi son. Because I'm going to be a big singer someday. Why, you ain't going to be nothing but a pimp. I stared at her angrily as she continued. My mother said singers go with entertainers or businessmen, while prostitutes go with pimps. I looked at her coldly. My mother told me something too, I said harshly. When I was three years old and in my mother's arms, she looked down at me and said, son, the way I'm taking care of you now, when you get old, always have your woman take care of you like this. Before she can interrupt, I continue. Furthermore, before my daddy died, he bought me a graveyard so that when I got old enough, I could drive my old Cadillacs there and leave them. I was talking fast now because she had hurt me. She started to walk off, but I grabbed her arm. Before you go, young bitch, I want you to know. You said a pimp ain't nothing but dig this. All I'm going to do is rest and dress. Buy gasoline and lean. Now can you dig where I'm coming from, young ho? Cause that's all you is. I'm gonna buy diamond rings and have the best of everything. I turned her arm loose. When you get home, tell your mammy that for me. I want her to know that when I get old, I want pimp wars. With that said, I turned my back on her and walked off. I felt a large lump in my throat. And my eyes were so watery, I couldn't call them raindrops, but I didn't cry. I walked tall, proud, because I knew I was going to be a pimp. After I got over the pain of that incident, I started gambling constantly. We were doing so well that Tony quit his job. Our next step was starting skipping school so we could gamble. Soon we both were keeping 50 to to $100 in our pockets at all times. Whenever we did go to school, we had our pick of the girls. They fought constantly over us. While this popularity of mine was growing, Janet drifted completely out of my life. One afternoon, after we had won all of the money on the school ground, we decided to skip the last three periods. After rambling up and down Hastings, we found a crap game in the alley. We watched for a while. Most of the players were factory workers. Tony caught my eye. I stepped back so we could talk. They were bouncing a pair of red dice off a barn door. Plus, there seemed to be a nice amount of money in the game. I knew what was on my mind. <clears throat> we had a set of tea with us, but they were white. Our red set of loaded dice was at the house, and that was probably. Jesse was at home still sleeping, and we were supposed to be in school. Tony tried to persuade me to slip into the house through a bedroom window. I shook my head stubbornly. I wasn't about to go for that. Jesse would kill me if she caught me skipping school. Suddenly, the lookout yelled, Cops! All of the guys gambling rushed through the garage door. Tony and I were caught flat-footed. Since we had been gambling, I wasn't worried on that account. My main concern was being taken home by the police. I hadn't forgot the beating I got the last time. Some police took me home. The two cops piled out the car as though we did rob the bank. One of them grabbed Tony and shoved him against the car. Spread your legs, nigga, he growled as he began to search him roughly. He found Tony's small bankroll in the tee. Nigga, you must have been doing pretty good in that crap game. Tony was scared. He answered slowly. Officer, I didn't even know how to play. We was just watching. The officer slapped him across the face, then kicked him until he scrambled on the back seat of the car. The other officer, who had been holding me, spoke up. Boy, what the hell color are you? 
The question took me by surprise. Colored, I answered. He slapped me in the mouth. Get up against the car, you black son of a bitch, he yelled angrily. Shaking with rage, I leaned against the back of the car. I felt my small roll of money being removed. When I complained, the other officer jabbed me in the stomach with his nice stick. Bending over, holding my stomach, I began to vomit. Some of the food splashed onto the foot of one of the officers. He cursed angrily. When I finished, he grabbed me by the shoulders and pushed me towards the open car door. When I raised my leg to step into the car, pain exploded in my testicles. The floor of the car came up to meet me as I sprawled out on the floor crying. The policeman who had kicked me stuck his foot and wiped the shoe off on me then told me to shut up. Tony rubbed the top of my head as if it might take away the pain. The police rolled us around for a while. They told us what would happen if they caught us in the alley shooting craps again. They tried to give us the impression that we were just lucky since all they were going to do was take the money. Not once did they mention school to us. At the time, we were only 13. They finally stopped and put us out. After threatening us again, they pulled off, leaving us about four miles from home with no money. What are we going to do? Walk or catch a cab and jump out and run? Tony asked. I didn't answer for a few moments. I don't see no sense in us going home without no kind of money, Tony. It was Tony turns for silence now. We walked for about five blocks this way until Tony stopped in front of a market. I grinned and followed him into the store. In less than 10 minutes, we were back on the street. We both had six steaks apiece. We continued walking until we found a colored beauty shop. At the first booth inside, we pulled out the meat. A heavy set woman doing hair stared at us closely. Where you get that meat at? She asked loudly. Her fingers were digging into the prime beef. The woman whose hair she was doing picked out four steaks. How much? She asked. Soon the small booth was full of bargaining women. Let me get one of them, another woman yelled. Fifteen minutes later, we were back on the street splitting the money. Nah, man, let's try that short con fast black shoulders. I ain't never used it before. It ain't no better time than now to find out if it works. We continued walking until we came to a drugstore. We entered and tried it, but it didn't work. Our next stop was a small grocery store. No luck. The third business entered was a dime store. I decided to try my luck this time. So Tony handed me the $10 bill in one spot. Could I have a pack of camels, please? I held the $10 bill out to the young girl behind the counter. When she returned with my cigarettes and change, she remarked, Aren't you a little young for smoking? For a moment, I ignored her question. Was that a 10, miss? Yes, she replied and raised her eyebrows. I pushed her a dollar and held on to the change she had given me. I'm sorry, miss. That's my father's 10. Will you please take the cigarettes out of this? That's my mother, and I can't get the money mixed up. Oh, she said, surprised. She took the dollar and went to the cash register. When she came back, she put the tin on the counter. I put the tin spot in my hand with the other money and started counting fast. 10, 15, 16, 19, 20. Just give me a 20 for that change, please. She looked down at the money and then stared at me. <clears throat> my heart skipped a beat. I almost broke and ran. 
Panic was settling in. If Tony hadn't come to my rescue, I'd have run. The other money belongs to my big brother, miss. My, I'm sure going to tell them what a pretty lady they got working in this store. The remark paid off. She picked up the money off the counter and put it in the cash register. He turned it with a 20. <clears throat> you boys be careful with all this money now, she said, smiling, with all of our teeth as we grinned on it on our way out the door. As soon as we hit the sidewalk, we got in the wind. We didn't start running until we were four blocks away. We ducked into an alley and lit up our cigarettes behind a garbage can. We laughed and smoked, then walked on, looking for another opportunity. We found nothing favorable until we came to John R. Street. There we came upon two slick old Negroes playing three-card molly with four white men. The whites were being trimmed smoothly. I was surprised when Tony asked the man handling the cards if he could make a bet. The old guy touching the cards looked up. Your money spins, boy, just like theirs. He laughed loudly at his own wit. Tony bet a dollar and lost, then two more with the same results. I stared at him and wondered if he could be losing his mind. We both knew how to toss the boards, but he was better than me. He quit suddenly, turned his back and walked away. I followed him down the street till he found a drugstore. <clears throat> when he went in, he found the women's section and bought some lipstick. Now I was sure he was going mad. On the way out, he stopped. How much money you got, poor son? When I replied, he stuck out his hand. I stared at him foolishly. Removing the lipstick from his pocket, he smeared a little on his finger. Shell out, man. Ain't you got no faith in me? I grinned and pushed my small bankroll into his hand. When we returned to the game, Tony watched the cars go back and forth for a while. Then he bet a dollar and lost. Picked up the other two cars to see where the queen was, put a tiny mark on it, dropped it back onto the ground with the other car over it. Old oh, man, you ain't slick, Tony said. I ain't gonna never let no old man beat me out of nothing. How much money can I bet? All you can get out with, came the reply. <clears throat> the old man switched the cars back and forth. Faster than I could follow. <clears throat> get your best down while I'm in town. Money on the wood makes the bet go good, he said, while bringing the cars to a halt. <clears throat> Tony made a $35 bet. <clears throat> reached over and turned up the queen. The old hustler swore, but thinking it was pure luck, paid off. Then, without hesitating, he began to toss the cards again. When he stopped, Tony spotted the tiny smear and bet the whole bankroll. He flipped the queen over again. The hustler paid off. While his lookout partner searched the back of the cards, I figured Tony had wiped the back of the queen off the last catch, but I wasn't taking any chances. I watched the cars coming up off the one-way street. As soon as I saw a break in the traffic, I hit Tony's arm. We crossed John R. on the run, turning up into the nearest alley. The hushers let out a yell behind us, so we knew they must have found the part of the mark. The traffic held them up. By the time they got across the street, we were cutting through backyards on our way to another alley. We bought three cans of reefer for $50 and split the rest of the money. That night, we gave a lawn party in my backyard for all of the young kids in the neighborhood. There was plenty of wine, weed, and beer. We had everything at the party but grass to dance on. <clears throat>